you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Like, subscribe, and follow us to stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Joining us this week for Ask a Historian, for we're responding to the questions that have come in once again, so thank you to everyone who sends in their questions, but this week's episode comes courtesy of a few questions by Ryan, uh, and Ryan was looking uh, for information on the rifle ranges, and so I figured, well, we'll go right to the uh, right to the source for uh, kind of South Mississauga, Port Credit, Lakeview, uh, and, uh, and, Clark, and, and Clarkson area, but uh, Richard uh, Collins is joining us once again, an, an old friend of the program here. Uh, Richard is uh, with the Mississauga South Historical Society, interpreter, historian, uh, uh, tour guide. That's probably where you get uh, what people see you the most. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, just uh, a passionate advocate for the history and heritage of uh, of, uh, of, of the South, South Mississauga and his hometown of Port Credit. So, um, But uh, to the subject at hand, uh, we're looking at the rifle ranges, which is really tied, we know, intrinsically to the story of Lakeview. Uh, um, but uh, the rifle ranges kind of ring down through time, but they had a, they had a long history. They're no longer operational, obviously, but uh, there was a time when we had active rifle range competitions and uh, training grounds here in Mississauga. Um, where were, we'll jump right into the questions here, but uh, uh, hmm. Rich, where were the rifle ranges in Lakeview? Uh, well, it was a big property, pretty much all of the lakeshore of Lakeview. Um, what all at one point rifle ranges it was hundreds of acres that went from pretty much what were a lot of factory buildings and warehouse buildings on the south side of lake shore uh from about uh cothra pretty much all the way to etobicoke creek at one point was all the rifle ranges right. and when, when you hear the word rifle ranges what does it mean well there's there's four three or four different places that were rifle ranges at different times and sometimes they get a bit confused some remains uh, are still around of some of the rifle ranges, but the first one that took up most of the property going way back to uh, 1892, I think quite early, uh, when uh, Lakeview was still farmland, but a lot of people in that area were closing down their farms because Toronto was growing out into the suburbs, and uh, there was a rifle, Ontario rifle range was in Toronto, and they trained at a place called New Fort York, which is next door the old Fort York. We have historic Fort York, which is still around the lovely historic building from 1812, where our Thompson Company frequently is seen doing their drilling. Hopefully we'll be getting back into that. been the historic Fort York for a while. But west of that was new Fort York, which is now the CE grounds. And the Ontario Rifle Ranges used to train there for about 25, 30 years from 1860 to the 1890s, when finally they got kicked off their property because the owners of the land says, we can make more money turning this into a permanent exhibition ground. Uh, uh, and so they were more or less kicked out. So you, you can't be firing your, uh, your, your rifles in the city area and whereas people were complaining about the noise. There was obviously safety concerns. And so they decided if they're going to get out, they're going to have to find some place that's a little bit rural, but still close enough to Toronto and still easy enough to get to. Keep in mind, there are no cars in the 1890s. So you got to be close to the railway tracks or the radio tracks if you're going to take the train out. And so they found this property, which was all these farms on, on uh, Lakeshore Road, west of Etobicoke Creek, south of Lakeshore Road. And they had the Lakeshore itself on the one side. So there's going to be no development south of them. And uh, again, mostly farmland to north. This was the perfect place to have this firing range where they could make all the noise they wanted, fire off guns to their heart's content, and still feel that they were going to be safe. They weren't going to hit passersby because there weren't a lot of passersby in, in Lakeview at the time. And, they're and so that's how the water. Ontario Rifle Association started. Yeah, I said, and they're shooting out into the water. so there's not And they're shooting water. towards the lake, yeah. And, and there were what they would call butts there. There were raised ridges that were there, and they would shoot into them. But of course, the straight bullets if you had some young trainees that really weren't good with their rifles <laughs> and uh, their bullets weren't going to uh, go in the right direction, yeah, they would head off into the lake. So it was the perfect place to be. A little bit of a challenge getting out there, but again, it was close to the railway tracks that are still there. The go trains still run close by. And after uh, 1905, when they really started getting big, the radio line ran trains out there every 20 minutes to every half hour. So it was an easy enough place to get to. Right. And, and I think one of, one of the, we think of the, the Ontario Rifle Association. It sounds like a, you know, a glamorized gun club in a sense. But the um, 
I mean, this became training grounds for soldiers come come periods of conflict, right? Like this is a the, the, these are significant yeah. part of our our military infrastructure. Yeah, around the eighteen nineties, when it uh, yeah when the ORE moved out, Canada didn't really have much of a military. We had been at peace for a long time since eighteen fourteen. And um, we didn't spend a lot of money on our army, and we kind of looked to these rifle associations as being kind of training grounds, so that if we ever did go to war, which of course not long after that with the, uh, the South African War, where we're looking for soldiers, and here was the perfect place to find people that had some experience firing rifles and could be brought into service. So we had kind of became an unofficial training ground for the future militia. And so the government supported and oftentimes gave money to clubs like that. And but competitions were held. So it was uh, even nowadays there are shooting clubs and uh, uh, even in Mississauga, there's still archery clubs around where people do training and archery and shooting are still part of the Olympics. So there's still serious competition. So it was a great place to hold uh, monthly uh, competitions with people from rifle ranges all across Ontario. And, and this was operational through both world wars, which also played a, a, a component of recruitment, right? Yeah, this is where things get a little bit confusing because the rifle ranges remained a private operation until the Second World War, and then Lakeview really changed uh, once uh, once the war started. Well, 1940, about a year uh, into the war, when Canada really started to um, enlist men, get them trained. We had to have a training ground. Uh, uh, basic training grounds were developed all across Canada. Basic training being where young men that were enlisting or uh, eventually those that were conscripted that never thought about fighting the war had to be given the basics of how to fire a rifle, how to use it. Also, you know, how to wear a uniform and how to properly salute your officers. That was basic <laughs> training. And so these training centers were all across Canada in 1940. But because the rifle ranges was there, the government bought it, uh, took over all the land. And again, it was a huge amount of land. And so rather than now just being a private rifle ranges, it was a huge basic training center where, I don't know what the number would be, but well into the tens of thousands just in Lakeview alone that were trained uh, before being sent over to Europe to fight in France and Italy. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, so it became a busy place. Uh, and so, yeah, that's when you, you had the your, uh, your basic training center replace the rifle ranges. But just to the west of that, you had, uh, we'll talk about a factory where all these weapons were made. And there were two separate rifle ranges, so to speak, that were associated with that. Right to the immediate west of the basic training center, then there was a special weapons rifle ranges, which was a portion of, of basic training. Where you, again, you still had your butts and you had all these soldiers firing against targets, but special weapons in this case were the, the Stens and the Brens, the submachine guns that most regular soldiers didn't use, but ones that were specially trained to be uh, 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 in the machine gun units uh, were trained with these special weapons because some of them were built next door at the small arms plant, which is where the the fourth one is, but also uh, a lot of factories, Inglis and Toronto being one of them, made Bren rifles. All the English uh, plants are gone now, but if you remember taking a train into Union Station, even up into the 90s, all the old English buildings used to be there. And because it was close by, they would take those weapons out to the small arms plant to be tested, and okay. then would take them out to the basic training, or rather to the special weapons training center to be tested. Again, out in the open field where you're firing in this case, the submachine guns out into the water. And then there's the fourth one where there are still remnants now of this fourth uh, rifle ranges, so to speak, where you still have these, uh, you have the sound barriers that are still there. But those are the ones that weren't related to the rifle ranges, as people tend to think of Lakeview being the rifle ranges area. This was specifically for testing the weapons that were made at the small arms plant. Every 100th uh, Lee Enfield a Mark IV rifle that came out, they made almost a million of them in three and a half, uh, almost four years. And they would take every 100th or so, take it off the line and test it to make sure that the lines were working properly. Uh, let's say if uh, some of the rifles were getting some kind of a metal burr or something that was stopping the bullet from going out, they'd have to know that before they shipped thousands of guns right. to the soldiers. And so they were tested. Uh, in this range where they shot against a concrete wall. The concrete wall is still there, plastered in 
graffiti, but it'd be nice to get it cleaned up. And then you have all these, at 45 degree angles, you have these wooden barriers that are stuffed with sand. And as you walk along the waterfront trail, which is all nicely maintained by the city, great for walking and cycling, and you and you ride your bike right past them, you see them, they're starting to fall apart. You could really use a face-up job. And they are historically significant. So it's something we should fix up, but you can see them there, but they weren't the targets. The concrete wall at the back was, these were the sound barriers that were at 45 degree angles so that the sound of the rifles as they were coming forward, they would bounce 90 degree angles. And when you get two sound waves that come at each other 90 degree angles, the sound waves cancel each other out. So it has the effect of softening or really deadening the sound of the, uh, of the rifles as they're being tested. And so that's that one. That's what they're there for. In fact, they might have, I'm not even too sure they went up during the war. They may have gone up after the war because it wouldn't be really much of a need for sound barriers at the small arms plant when you had a special weapons training center and a uh, basic training center uh, in hundreds of acres to the east of it going 24-7 uh, during the war. And it's possible that when all this private development, all these residences went into Lakeview after the war, uh, the small arms plant continued to make weapons even in peacetime. It, were, it ran until 1975. So for 30 years after the war, uh, this small arms factory in Lakeview was still making weapons just you know for peacekeeping forces uh, during Korean War, things like that. And so I think that may have been when they were put up so that people were complaining that uh, the, the rifles being tested and were awful noisy in the neighborhood. Yeah, you know what? I uh, th thank you, and that was a beautiful segue into what his uh, what Ryan's second question was. There was on the the wooden walls along the waterfront yeah. trail, but you know, I never actually uh, connected to the thought that it was sound. I always figured, well, if someone was a really bad shot, it ricochet the uh, bullets into the middle of the range. <laughs> there were some bullets. If you look, uh, apparently you can see them. But usually, the people that were firing them were Are were trained, so, yeah, because they were working. The, uh, they were fired from behind the inspection building, the one building that's still standing, the historic building that's been uh, uh, designated and been protected. And so, yeah, chances are the people that were regularly firing these Mark IVs that were coming off the line were trained and they were pretty good at not having stray bullets. Uh, but I'm sure the occasional one must have gone astray. But yeah, I know it was mostly to, to deaden the sound of the constant firing of the, of the rifles. You, you mentioned the concrete wall, which is kind of a, uh, the, the backstop, if you will, of the, of the, uh, the small arms limited uh, rifle range. Um, was, was it something they put targets on and, and shot at targets? They might have. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess they would have had to have something because if, if they are testing the accuracy, because that's another thing that you would test to make sure, especially if you had the sniper rifles where you were testing mm -hmm. the scope to make sure that it was aligned so that, you know, when you focus the scope, that the bullet would hit, obviously that's the intention of the scope is to show you where the bullet is going to hit the target. Uh, I, there's no photographs of them, as far as I know, of that building, but I'm assuming, yeah, there must have been some kind of targets that can be replaced to be tested. Uh, but yeah, if anyone has any photographs, I'd love to find them somewhere. A lot of photographs have taken, as you know, Heritage Mississauga has a huge collection that the National Film Board took of the interior of the buildings and the women working in the factories. Yeah. But not that I know of much about the actual testing of the uh, Rifles no, outside. No, I, I you can. Uh, we'll show an aerial here, but you, there's aerials where you can see the uh, the baffles at 45 degree angles. You can see mm. them clearly. Um, but so so just to, to lay the land, then um, the ORA has, uh, I believe, if I correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, it had a a short range, a medium range, and a long range. So it had three rifle ranges associated with the ORA when it began, and then they added a special weapons range as well. Is during the second, uh, well, yeah, during the second war, the special weapons, yeah, was specifically to test the Brins and the Stens, the submachine right. guns. Right. Yeah, there might have been uh, different ranges. Uh, I'm not sure why, although I think maybe with, if it was the Ontario Rifle Association, uh, just like uh, any kind of club, there's probably different types of, of pistols and rifles. Yeah. And so you have people that are shooting with rifles wouldn't be competing with people that are shooting with pistols. And things. so you probably have short, medium, and long range, depending on the type of of weapon was your preferred competition rifle. So, so they were they were located towards Cothra Road on the south side of Lakeshore, right? And I then... remember uh, recently talking to again Chris Deftley, who was uh, uh, very much involved in getting the one building across the street, uh, the uh, uh, Lakeview Park uh, School, uh, and she talked about her dad 
uh, during the depression and, and, and the first world war, uh, second world war rather. Uh, yeah, he was one of the people that changed the targets on the bus. And she remembered them oddly enough, yeah, kind of facing towards the road, which seemed counterintuitive to me. I thought they would be facing the lake, but she definitely remembers her dad would be one of the people that would go in and regularly change the targets. Cause of course, as they got shot up in competition, they need to be replaced. Right, right, right. Um, and so obviously they're not operating now. Um, uh, what? Yeah, the Rifle Association, I think the last competition I was able to find looking looking through the old uh, Port Credit Weeklies where they would keep the, uh, the scores seemed to die off by the late 70s, I think by 1957, 1958, the competitions. Well, and then the other thing that happened was that uh, around that time uh, is when uh, Toronto Township, as it was still at the time, Mississauga was passed was uh, having problems with its taxes and realized they needed to get more industries in town. This is when Mary Fix was elected as our uh, as our first female reeve. And one of her big goals was to take the burden off all the farmers and the residences were paying taxes and get more industries, more factories here. And the rifle ranges was the perfect place to sell off, uh, to put it. And so there's a lot of factories and warehouses that date back to the late 50s and, and early 60s that were put up at that time. And I think that's another reason that pretty much put into the competition is that the township saw that there was a better use for this land, uh, a more financially productive use of the land, if not necessarily a better use, uh, right. in closing down the rifle ranges and converting into an industrial land. Uh, you also had the uh, the tragedy there of the the young boy Raymond McGinnis who lost his life on the rifle ranges. Do you know the? I've, I read about that story in Vernon Way May Weeks's book. Uh, yeah, so I remember talking. hearing more about that from you. I remember you okay. telling me about that. About yeah, McGinnis was his name, and yeah. I don't really. I, I don't. Maybe you remember the story better than I do. I think some the kids were just known for playing that area. I don't know yeah. Yeah. whether it was a grenade or something because. Uh, uh, the small arms family didn't make grenades, but they did. There was some photographs from the National Film Board where the women were filling up other things other than rifles, uh, putting gunpowder. And so I guess maybe at one point there were women whose job was to uh, fill uh, grenades with gunpowder and pack them on and ship them over. And so maybe uh, an errant grenade. Uh, I don't know how it got out into the field, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, the kids were playing and they saw this green pineapple looking thing. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, whatever they did with it, it exploded. He was killed. I think yeah, it was well, injured. Uh, yeah, that was 1957. Raymond McGinnis. Uh, it was a. Uh, I want to say he was 11 or 12 years old. Um, and uh, that was one of the things that really started to get the public against having, um, uh, you know, this active military use within their within a residential area. Really. Yeah, it's um, actually right about the time that the uh, factory started going up. Yeah. Yeah, so that was prob certainly uh, probably something that the township was thinking about. But yeah, but having some yeah young kid get killed so tragically, I almost certainly got the public behind. Let's get yeah. rid of this rifle range. I was gonna say it was a, it was a perfect storm to push them out of town, really, and uh, yeah. uh, kind of. So I, I always I always uh, when I hear people talk about it, it it's uh, the rifle ranges and the the idea that it's plural and there were many and over a long period of time really do speak to a portion of the history of Lakeview and. Um, Kind of that idea how the the waterfront uh was never really open to the public uh, no I, that's the one thing i've been uh thinking about with this new developments going in that the city developers should actually go with some kind of promotion where yeah for the first time in over a century the people in lakeview will actually get their lake view back because <laughs> yeah. it's a community that's never really had a view of its lake it was either the rifle range which of course were obviously closed off to the public for safety reasons and then it was converted over to war uses yeah. and became barracks for a while and then finally replaced by industries and then the big uh, hydro uh, thermal electric power station was there and yeah the poor folks of lakeview never really had access to their own lake and now they're getting it well we also have to remember that really uh, short-lived but significant story of the uh, barracks buildings being taken over for emergency housing following uh, Hurricane Hazel, right? The the Shep uh, uh, use there for oh yeah, even before yeah, they were they were used when people lost their housing during Hurricane Hazel, but they were uh, first used after the war when a lot of veterans were coming home and a lot of them had spent three, four, five years over in Europe fighting and didn't have their own homes. Now that they're discharged as veterans and and they've got a, a you know good pension for, being, uh, pension for being veterans but now they need places to live but the places they live aren't there anymore 
and so they need no homes. And yes, so a lot of the barracks were converted, uh, but they weren't really suited for families because, again, uh, a barracks is where you might get 10, 12, 16, 20 men in one room, you know, sharing 20 beds. Uh, but that was, that's not suitable for uh, a husband and a wife and a couple of kids uh, that are looking for housing right at the end of the war. And so, yeah, it quite became quite a contentious issue. Uh, the government saying, well, we can't afford to. Uh, uh, well, part of the problem is that the, they left the problem with the townships to have to pay uh, for this uh, because, uh, again, looking even nowadays, it's, it's uh, the responsibility of the region of Peel to make sure that there's enough housing for low income people. It's not really a provincial or federal issue, but the township, it, township trial time saying, well, yeah, but you're the guys in an odd sort of way who won the war, uh, which is, means you're responsible for these people coming back. And so really the federal government should take some kind of responsibility. And finally they did, but you did have that period in uh, uh, 46, 47, 48, where there was a lot of bickering between the levels of government as to who should be paying to uh, house all these veterans that were coming home. Yeah. And it finally got solved by uh, developments like Applewood Acres, that came in the late 40s and early 50s in which homes like real homes for families started to get built uh, for veterans yeah i was i was researching a, a property today that connected to the 1946 veterans land land act which was the uh there was it uh two acres in freedom uh idea this idea of these little two acre plots uh, of land that the Veterans Land Act would buy and make available to uh, returning soldiers, uh, yeah. and uh, right along Cothra Road in Lake Sh Lakeshore in Lakeview uh, was where all these properties uh, were were uh, created uh, as a subdivision of the Cavan Farm for the Veterans Land Act. Uh, hmm. So you know, just but it ties into this, right? Those returning yeah. soldiers uh, coming home looking for. Yeah, and a lot of those homes that are in that area, they almost certainly date to uh, yeah, right after the Second War. So that's. Yeah. yeah, that's that's where they would have hosed them. Yeah, well, so Lakeview, yeah, it's got even where people are still living. A lot of history connected to the wars. Lakeview is really, really important center across Canada for Canada's military effort and second war, and even factor the Air Force in there too. Because while most of that activity took place out of Moulton Airport, which is where Pearson is now, uh, but they still had to drop their bombs somewhere, and the only place to drop them safely was out in Lake Ontario. And so the planes leaving, uh, they used Dixie Road as a dead reckoning. To get their planes out to the lake, and then there was the there was the bomb testing uh, center at part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Program out of Malton, but Lakeview was where uh, the targets were. Um, and you you got to uh, you wonder what it was like living here at the time, knowing that you know, all these military uses were all around you, and uh, it must yeah. be quite an interesting time to live. You know, the planes flying overhead with the the Com uh, British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and. Uh, um it's just a fascinating time and uh lots of jobs available that was one thing yeah you had a lot of noise and safety issues but uh yeah there, uh, employment wasn't a problem in lakeview at that time it was mm. a real center and they say the small arms building itself even after the war it stayed in operation for 30 years and even after small arms limited the, 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 the division of of the company during peacetime closed down the small arms building was still in in business until uh, I don't know, 2005, I think Ontario Hydro was in there for the longest time. Right. And they only closed down after they shut down the new generating station and the four sisters came down and eventually the big generator building came down. But up to that time, it was a training center for people that worked at the, uh, the thermal and hydroelectric power stations. Right, right. No, it is, it is a fascinating story. I just, you know, recommend anybody who wants to, to learn more, uh, Verna May Week's book on Lakeview, mm. there's, there's a volume two, two, volume yeah. two um, that uh, capture kind of these these community stories, the rifle ranges, small arms limited, but there are so many more resources out there. But it, we, we haven't even touched on the aerodrome. The aerodrome was part mm. of this, uh, this property complex for a period of time. Uh, maybe we'll do another episode on the aerodrome somewhere, somewhere down the line. But uh, Great stories about the aerodrome too and some of the people that work there, famous people that we don't there, realize. There we go. We'll, we'll, we'll segue this into so it. So keep that in mind. We'll, we'll segue <laughs> this into another episode on, on the aerodrome. So anybody interested down the road, we'll do another interview on, mm. on, on the aerodrome. But the rifle ranges were a significant component and really one of the ones that has, has relatively disappeared off our landscape. Um, and uh, uh, But for a long period of time, from the 1890s into the, the late 1950s, we had you know operational firing ranges uh right here in mississauga in the lakeview area so richard 
thank you for sharing your knowledge, your passion for this with us. Uh, I, I know it's something you love to talk about and I really oh, yeah. appreciate your time here. So thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of Ask a Historian. Sending your questions each and every week and we'll continue to explore uh, the history, the fascinating stories of the city of Mississauga. If you have questions specific to Richard, we'll get them back on as well. Uh, but uh, like, subscribe and follow us and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Ask a Historian. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Thanks.